Good noon, everyone. Um, first, thank you, Charles, for the introduction. What I'll do today is to talk about private equity. This is ongoing research, uh, joined with Martin Sorensen, who is a faculty member here at Columbia Business School, and Jing Chang Yang, who is a professor at the Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. OK. Um, Just to get everybody on board, um, these are two endowment funds, and this is the allocation. So obviously, you can see that the private equity allocation is huge, about a third for Yale and about a quarter for uh, Stanford. If you look uh, down and look at the, uh, the other asset classes, also what you notice is that the alternative investments okay, carry an enormous amount of uh, weight in the allocation. Okay, so clearly private equity is important. I guess we don't have to argue that. Um, just this is the a basic structure uh, for how the private equity fund works. You have uh, a GP, general partner, who manages uh, the investment. Okay, go find the cheap assets. You know, go restructuring, do whatever it's supposed to do, create value. Okay, and you have limited partners like Yale, uh, Stanford endowments, who contribute capital. And uh, various fees get paid because they don't work for free, and they're supposed to create the alpha. Um, and what they do is they set up this limited partnership, um, meaning liability at the, is limited at the fund level. And so, so this is the structure, uh, and that's what we're going to study. Okay, so I already mentioned this. Broadly speaking, uh, you can view this line of research that I'm going to show you as part of the uh, ongoing research that we. Uh, that we are looking into not just private equity per se, but hedge funds, real estate, and natural resources, and commodities, and so on. About three years ago, I think, when I gave uh, a talk here with Suresh, actually, in the same session, about three years ago, the same PFS uh, uh, series, I talked about the hedge funds. So this is the sequel, you can view that way. All right. Um, how do we value alternative investment? Clearly, as the, uh, the one of the pictures that I showed you earlier showed, it's got delegate management problem, right? Whenever you have a delegate management problem, you got incentive problems, right? Um, and compensation is, of course, the core, right? Uh, and the contractual design, some of you may know that the contract looks like 220. Okay, is that optimal? You're not going to see uh, see anything on that today, but I'm just going to throw that out. More broadly, you can think about contractual design between the GP and LP. Uh, presumably, if you pay somebody to work, they got to be skilled. Okay, so the question is, how do we measure skill? How do we define skill, um, conceptually and quantitatively? And also, private equity, or more broadly, um, alternative investments. Unlike uh, standard public equity investments, they got a lot of rich institutional features. For example, liquidity. Right, you go in, you are locked in for ten years, and see you later. And uh, the risk-return trade-offs are very complex. They're very different from the typical standard beta type of analysis you see in, uh, in, in finance courses. They build on the betas. We still got betas, but it's a little richer than that. Um, OK. And also, you know, to think about the valuation of these asset classes, you cannot really talk about that in isolation. The public market investment, you just look at the market price. Whatever it is, whatever it is. Right? In private equity context, it's a lot different. It's illiquid, and also it depends on your overall portfolio allocation, say, for Stanford Endowment. So it's very, very uh, a different uh, uh, conceptual uh, um, issue here. All right, so what we're going to do today is you know, I'm going to show you a model, a theory, the theory paper, mostly. And it's got a, what I view as most important features involving private equity. These are the fees, two, two kinds, management and incentive fees, and illiquidity, well, I'll be more clear, and managerial scale. Okay? Um, so that will be the core of today's presentation. And uh, you know, how many of you actually worked in private equity or been exposed to private equity? Okay, so you probably heard about, you know, know that there's a heavy use of leverage, especially on buyouts. Not much on venture capital, but on buyouts. The question is, you know, academics tend to say, no, 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 MM holds Marigliani Miller, right? So everybody knows Marigliani Miller. Okay, so how can leverage ever be possibly valuable? Well, not quite so when you look at the frictions, okay, which we'll, well, I'll talk about it today. So it pro provides a one step forward explanation to the possible use of heavy leverage. Okay. Um, and then once we have the model, I'll do a simple calibration. 
Uh, that's really, again, first step, just to show you what the numbers look like and what you need to be think about, whether you're from the GP or LP's perspective. The paper is going to be written mostly from the investor's perspective, the LP's perspective. But having said, it also helps a lot if you think from the GP's perspective. OK, I already mentioned this as a pre uh, preview, right? Classic finance theory, beautiful, elegant, super powerful, but assumes efficient markets, which means no arbitrage, which means beta pricing. You know, and uh, how do you price derivatives while well, you do dynamic replicating portfolio analysis, all the great stuff, okay? Uh, and I encourage everyone to take derivatives class, or advanced derivatives, please. You know, you're going to see that even you do private equity, you know, derivatives and options are loaded everywhere. So don't just look at the title of the course and say, oh, that's advanced derivatives. I'm not in for it. I highly recommend it, okay, even though I do private equity. All right, so a little bit more institutional detail. Management fees, usually it's quoted about, a, a, you know, one half to two percent of uh, committed capital, incentive fees, it shows up in all kinds of you know, uh, alternative investments. 20% of the profits, how they define profits, a little bit different from hedge funds to private equity and so on. Scale is important. And the bottom line that sort of that underpins this paper is that not only should we think about the capital markets, okay, where finance scholars have heavily focused, focused on, right? You also want to think about labor market, okay? Because after all, who finds cheap deals? who create value, well, the managers, presumably. So you want to think about uh, uh, interconnection between capital and the labor markets. Okay. okay, so illiquidity in the U.S., typically you go in, you commit. Stanford says $100 million to Blackstone, and Blackstone has the option to call uh, Stanford over 10 years to draw up to $100 million of capital, part of which goes to pay their management fees, okay, say $20. Uh, $20. Okay. Um, now, because it's illiquid, it's most likely that you cannot appeal to the standard dynamic replicating portfolio analysis that we use in derivatives. It does not mean it's not important. You gotta understand that's the starting point, but you gotta sort of go beyond that. That's the point. Okay, so what's gonna happen is you got a P specific risk that cannot be fully hedged or, or traded. Okay. Now because of that, you need a, a little richer framework to look into <coughs> this issue. Leverage, right? So Think about Stanford gives Blackstone $100 million. Let's just for the sake of discussion, Stanford is the only in investor in the fund, and the Blackstone takes $100 million, load up with $300 million from the banks, and go buy something that's worth $400 million, just for the sake of discussion. That's what the blocks show, boxes show, okay? Take that as given. Now what's gonna happen is the following, right? So because you take on leverage, uh, the horizontal axis is the P exit value. So let's say, to fix the idea, Blackstone buys the asset at date zero today, and it's going to exit in 10 years for the sake of discussion. In 10, ye in 10 years, okay, Blackstone is going to sell the asset. So what's going to happen first in terms of cash flows? I'm a finance guy, okay, cash flows. All right, so you've got to pay the banks, right, obviously. They're senior. So from LP and GP's perspective, you get nothing if you really did horrible in terms of exiting, okay? Say you get zero, well, nobody gets paid. You get one, you still got to pay the uh, banks. All right, so after you pay the banks, all right, and then you enter into this region called uh, um, you know, repayment of capital and uh, some interests included, which they usually call PREF. You know, usually what Stanford gets is like 9% or 8% uh, on the committed capital back first, and then the GPs get to take their cut. So what's going to happen here is the LP takes a 45 degree line and uh, GP gets nothing. Okay, other than the management fees, which they take on top, which, which basically means management fees are super senior. Okay, it's not in this picture. Okay, so uh, is, is everybody okay with this? So you see that's options, right? Okay. <coughs> now then they enter the phase of called catch up region, where the GP gets no, uh, get the, the LP gets no cut usually. Okay, sometimes you have 80, 20, but usually the typical case is now the GP says, I've worked so hard, you get your 9% compounded rate of return back, now it's my turn to take my money. So the GP says 100%, right? So all the marginal, these are increments, right? All the marginal money goes to the GP, which is why this is a 45 degree line. Okay, and the, well, the slope adds up to one, so the GP stays flat, okay? That's why it's a flat for the GP, uh, for, sorry, for the LP. And then you enter into the region where all the GP managers, right? That's what they want, that's what they're thinking about, right? Which is 80-20 split. They really want to hit the jackpot here, because then, you know, if Stanford gives them $100 million, let's say, you know, the, after the interest, so if 100 becomes 200, they really take 20% of the increment to 100, well, that means $20 back, right? 
So that's where the jackpot is, and that's where they want to be. Having said, as an investor, before going in, you got to understand that while as much as you want to be here, it's totally plausible, such as in crisis, you end up over the, in these regions, and you got to think about ex ante before you commit our capital, the risk return trade-offs. Make sense? So this is, as you can see, this is a straight option analysis, right? It's got all these, uh, you know, linearities going on. All right, so you put out this capital stack, okay? Uh, so put the senior pieces on top, the junior pieces on bottom. So what's going to happen? Well, first you've got to pay the banks. So the top part is the debt, principal plus interest. And then you pay the LP, which we call the PREF region. The PREF region has two parts, the committed capital back and plus the compounded rate of return, which you usually refer to hurdle, just sum up. And this is the catch up. In the example I show you, that's really 100% of green. Oh, here, it's, think about now. Real estate, private equity funds usually go with 80-20 or something like that in the terms of catch up. And then here, that's where the big pot is. So that's the 80-20 split. So if you look at this, right, so we know that in finance, we slice uh, boxes two ways. Horizontal slice means seniority. Vertical slice means in pair of pursuit, equal seniority. And it's very important how you slice it. So the different pieces, different colors fit. And basically, from the GP's perspective, that's their present value. That's what they want to value, okay? And LP, the red part is how they want to value, okay? Cool, are we all good on this? Okay. All right, so now you often hear that, you know, well, LPs are not gonna invest if GP don't, GPs do not put their money in. So usually they say, well, GPs put 10% of equity. So 10% means vertical slice, okay? So you go into, and GP becomes 10% of the LP, and so the GP's leg is stick a little bit further in. And in theory, that helps aligning incentives because no longer do they care about these very junior pieces, they also care about senior pieces. That clear? Okay, so that's part of contractual design. All right. I gotta show you three equations, and this is the equation one. I know it looks a little bit heavy, but I really wanna do it because you get a feel why Black Scholes actually is relevant. So let's not, let's stop bashing about Black Scholes, say let's just bunch of academic creation, it's really relevant. All right, so here we go. So private equity, you gotta use Black Scholes to value private equity, except you gotta make two changes. Even under a strong assumption, which is full spending, so what is this full spending business? This is what I mean. It's not real estate. I'm going to augment the model later, but this is a great benchmark. So what does that mean? That means all the risk you want to get yourself exposed to. So why do I want to get exposed to risk? Because you get excess return, right? Okay, good. So why do you want to suppose all the risk that you get exposed to? You can also, uh, via PE, you can expo uh, get uh, risk exposure in the public markets. Suppose that's not true, for the sake of discussion, say that's true. Then what's gonna happen is that, this is what we call false spending. In other words, all the exposures you want from private equity, you can get elsewhere. So then you get some sort of arbitrage condition going on, okay, at the background. I mean, after everything's done, after my hard work uh, is complete, here's what you get. It says that LP, what is LP, this letter, okay, just give you a little idea. It's basically the valuation model for how much the LP's interest is. It's what LP should be care, caring about. It's the present value, okay, of all future returns. So let's solve this complicated equation. So why do I want to show it? Because I want to make two points. One, looks just like Black Scholes, okay, and it's some nice formula. And second, I want to point out the alpha. So because managers are charging 20% uh, on the profits, and they're charging 2% of interest, right? So that's the management fees, okay? And because they charge 20% uh, uh, carry, that shows up in what we call boundary conditions, a little bit ticked up term. But anyway, at the end of the day, it looks just like Black Scholes, but it makes two points. Management fees are accounted for, and incentive is accounted for, and alpha is accounted for. Managerial skill, alpha, think about alpha as managerial skill in finance jargon, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna show you some numbers, okay? That's the equation, so I'm gonna take standard numbers, so 220, so that means, sorry. Okay, so 220 compensation, the typical, 100% catch up, that's uh, N equals 100. Hurdle 8% means Stanford needs to get 8% compounded rate of return for the money they give you. If they gave you money 10 years ago, you gotta take 1.08 to the 10th power. And that's the money you gotta give back to Stanford. That's 8%. Holding period 10 years, for, and you invest the capital, that's $100 million. And interest rate 5%, volatility of typical private equity portfolio company, okay? So this is like a Blackstone portfolio. The volatility typically is around 25%, if Blackstone is represented, which is not quite. But anyway, so using these numbers, you see that the model is super simple. It looks really loaded up, but it's actually very simple because this is all you need to calculate. Turns out beta doesn't really matter in this calculation because of the full spending assumption. Okay. It's just like derivatives, right? Beta is not relevant. All right, so here's the result. Okay, so I want to use focus for panel B, okay? Focus on panel B. So here's what's going on. So it turns out 
what's the minimum level of alpha, the managerial skill that Stanford needs to require for, uh, the, for the Blackstone to invest their money and charge 220. It turns out they need annualized excess return, absolute return of 1%. Because this is loaded up at 3 to 1. So leverage helps a lot. Okay, so I'm going to give you intuition a little bit if we have time. But the bottom line is that this is the break even. This is the minimum skill you want Blackstone to deliver. The question is how? Well, that's another question. But for now, just say that's your hurdle. Now, basically, that means IF means incentive fee. So Stanford basically is, oh, sorry, Blackstone is going to take $100 million from Stanford and turn that into present value. Let me be clear. Present value, not future value, present value, right? In finance, we talk about present value of $142 million, out of which, well, Stanford is willing to invest if it doesn't lose money, right? This is standard capital markets competition, right? So that means at least Stanford gets 100. You say, well, why would I do if I get 100? We can juice up that a little bit, make 110 if you want. But for the sake of discussion, say Stanford doesn't make any excess profit. It all goes to the GP, okay? It's, these are the Blackstones, KKRs that make all the money. So they make $42. So what does that mean? That means if you believe the 220 contract being the right contract, this is what yeah. happens. Stanford gives $100 million. Blackstone guys spends all the effort working for 10 years. Take the $100 million, turn that into $142 million in present value as of today. So in future value, it's going to be something like 350 or something bigger, much bigger. Okay? But in present value, because that's how you compare numbers. And out of this, $23 go, because, go to the GP via the compensation, via 20% profits, and $20 million just because they're charging the management fees along the way. It's like fixed income. Okay? So roughly speaking, it's a half-half split. I mean, it's a little bit, you know, incentive fee looks a little bigger, but call it half half. Okay. Now, okay. So, if, okay. So now let me give you some, my, some, a little bit more concrete idea why quantitative models are relevant. Suppose, let's say you're the Stanford manager. You go out. You want to sign a contract with Blackstone. How do you know whether it should be two twenty or one and a half and thirty? Right. You hear people talk about these terms all the time. They say, look, after crisis, the um, the LP space says, look, no more two percent. You got to go down to 1%, right? We are willing perhaps to pay you a little bit to carry more, okay, like 30%, 25 but no more 2%. Well, you want a, a, some metric to report these numbers. Here's what you see. The bolded black line is what you saw on the last slide. Let me show you the leverage slide because I think I will be running out of time. Okay, so let me show you the leverage one, okay? With the leverage, 220, the, 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 the uh, horizontal row, what's happening is, Right, as you saw on the last slide, the incentive fee is worth about 23% in PV, and management fee is about $20 million in PV. Supposing you cut the contract, change the contract to one and a half and 30%, what's going to happen? Well, the incentive fee, let me just do this. Oh, you can see that red number, the first red number. The incentive fee in present value goes way up to $35 million. And the management fee goes down because now you only pay this guy one and a half, goes down to about $14 million. And the total for GP actually goes up to $49 million. Okay? Because of that, actually, LP is going to lose money in this case. Instead of getting $100 in present value back, the, the LP has only got $94 in present value back. If you believe that contract, what really happened when you sign up the contract, Stanford lost $6 million, 6% of its committed capital right on the spot, if you believe the story I told you. So, so this is why a model like this is useful because it gives you a framework to think about different contracts. You know, of course, you want to be a little bit you know, uh, um, cautious with what numbers you want to put in, right? But having said, this is the model that you want to think about, it, not just sort of you know, throwing a number out randomly. Okay? All right. So this is the last slide with the equation. But I've got to show that because I just told you that I, I, I rigged a model that's not super realistic. Here's how you fix it. Okay? So you know, after heavy lifting, here's what happens. Because typically the P specific risk cannot be uh, obtained in the public market, right? The point, presumably, that you invest in Blackstone is because these guys can find undervalued assets or get some, you know, risk return uh, adjusted better uh, opportunity, right? That's why it's an uh, intermediary, right? So if you believe that story, what you really want to say is that some of the risk is actually spent by the public market, but some is not. So once you allow what we call non-full spending, which is partial spending, okay, like some risk you really can only get exposed via the private equity. If you do that, okay, forget about all these terms, the last term, okay, the last term that looks kind of wacky, that term is, is what captures what we call illiquidity, right? You know, I'm sure if you've seen private equity or 
you know, uh, talked about it, you heard about illiquidity, right? You know, the problem you get in private equity is you're not seeing your money for 10 years, and that's kind of scary. Who knows what's going to happen in 10 years? I'm losing all the investment opportunities in between 10 years where I can redeploy my money, right? It's a commitment, right? You basically sold an option to, to the GP, right? So all these issues are totally legitimate. How do you quantify that number? Here's the thing. Okay. So that's that number, and then what we do is that we have two valuations. I showed you the LP valuation earlier. And I'm having this V valuation, which is a certain equivalent, taking into account this additional friction risk called illiquidity. So this difference is called illiquidity. How big is it? Here we go. So trust me, these are reasonable numbers. These are public market excess position, 6%, 20% vol. Beta, unlevered, typically 0.5. You know, uh, levered is like one half here, okay? So because uh, unlevered is a lot smaller. Okay, so you take these numbers. By the way, the numbers, you can choose whatever you want. So here's the result I want to focus, and then, you know, Charles has told me that I'm almost out of my time. Here's what I want to show you. Okay, so I showed you this row. So, okay, so $100, okay, that's the break even. Now, if you ignore the fact that you are locked in for 10 years, roughly speaking, okay, what you really have, would have assigned the value would have been 141. So Stanford substantially cut its valuation, rightly so, because he com Stanford committed a 10-year lockup. Because of that, the valuation should not be 141, which is the first formula. If I use the first formula, that's the value I would have got because that's way overstating the value. You got to bring down to 100, and that little, you know, complicated last term on the last page basically captures the 41 million dollars. That's about a 40 percent discount, roughly. Okay. So, and the total compensation of GP is about 50. So if you 50, 40, put a little standard error, roughly, it's about equal. So what does that mean? That means, roughly speaking, your liquidity is about half of the cost to investing in private equity. And compensation is about half of the cost in present value, okay? It only makes sense to talk about present value. Now, in the last slide, I want to just touch this, and I'm done, I'm sorry. And I want to give you some sense, like, how does this, so with this model, and you look at the data, do private equity overperform risk-adjusted for investors, okay? So here's what I want to show you, this picture. So uh, there's something called public, Market equivalent, did you guys working in private equity heard about this? No, Pro public, okay, all right. It's uh, basically what it means is that you take all the realized cash flows and you use realized market return at, over the contemporaneous period, same period from the market, and you do that arithmetic, it says the ratio, it gets the ratio, and you compare with the market performance. If the ratio is larger than one, people tend to think that's good because you overperform the market. Not so, based on the model, you gotta be overperforming by 1.3. In other words, investing in private equity because of additional risk and compensation, you got to require this public market equivalent to be about 1.3. Keep it simple. Here's what I mean. So you got to expect about 30% excess return performance, roughly speaking, by going with private equity because of additional complications. That's roughly what it is. Now, if you look at that and you look at the data, roughly they just line spot on. So in other words, the takeaway is, sorry, so here's the takeaway. The takeaway is, Private equity has its value to exist. The problem, not the problem, the equilibrium turns out to be LPs, risk adjusted, compensation adjusted, illiquidity adjusted, don't really make a lot of money, okay? LPs are not overly, on average, I'm not saying Stanford and Yale, they probably made money, but on average, they don't really do that well. They break even, they don't lose money on average. But the GPs made a lot of money, obviously. That's why everybody wants to be a GP, right? Not on the on the LP side. <coughs> so this is just a study with a model guided, okay, that shows you that the consensus, or not consensus, it's a very political, anyway, it's, it's not at all consensus, but anyway, so based on our study, it looks like LPs taking all the costs into account may seem just on average break even, and the GPs made all the money. Okay, by the way, that's consistent with the efficient market, labor market, so there's nothing wrong with that, I guess. Okay, so, but anyway, so the division of surplus is a little bit different. So here we go. So if you want to take one number away, I would say roughly speaking, if you invest uh, $100 million with a, a, a private equity firm, your expectation should be something like this guy's going to turn $100 into $140 in present value, risk adjusted. That's very important. All kinds of risk adjusted. So basically the $40 million, 40% markup pretty much goes to the GP, roughly speaking. So that's the paper. And uh, in the end, I want to show you a Stanford, a Columbia did pretty well. <laughs> All right, so I'm done. Thank you very much.